we're going to hear the scriptures read to us. Um, Vicky's going to come and do that. Thank you, Vicky. Um, page 735, and then Josh will be preaching to us. Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 13. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due to me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to whom, sorry, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances to say to the captives, come out, and to those in the darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat upon them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar some from the north, some from the west, some from the region of Aswan. Shout for joy, O heavens, rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. This is the word of the Lord. Um, it's so nice to look out and see so many familiar faces. Um, it's also nice to look out and see so many unfamiliar faces. Um, I hope you're praising God for the way that God is growing this church. Um, it is a real privilege to be back. It's a privilege to be in the pulpit and preaching God's word. Um, let's pray as we come to God's word together. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. What do you think you need the most? What do you think you need the most? Maybe for you, there's something really difficult in your life and you feel the burden of it weighing on your shoulders. And the thing that you think you need the most is for that burden to be lifted away from you. Or maybe there's something that occupies your daydreaming, something good that you're longing for that will come in the future. What do you think you need the most? Whether you feel like your life is easy or hard or somewhere in the middle, we spend a lot of time 
longing for change, hoping for something better. We plan holidays in our minds when we should be working at our desks. We wait patiently sometimes, less patiently other times, for medical treatments to end. We find ourselves escaping into books or into films or TV just to get away from life as it is. We hope for relationship troubles to come to an end. Sometimes that kind of swirling mass of things that we're worrying about is blown away by one event that crystallizes what we really need. Sometimes it's a moment of intense joy. So Samuel and Ify are holding their baby in their arms. And if you've ever held a baby, it doesn't matter if it's yours or somebody else's, you look down at it and nothing else matters in that moment. You are holding new life in your hands. You're trying your hardest not to drop it. Those two are kind of fighting against each other. It can come from joy. It can come from tragedy as well. I'm sure many of you over the last couple of weeks have read of the migrant ship that sank off the coast of Greece and have been praying that more survivors would be found and brought home. I'm sure over the last week, lots of us were praying for those five men on the submarine of the Atlantic, praying that they would come home. Some days when we hear of news like that, actually we realize that the thing that really matters, some days, is just coming home safely. This morning, my prayer is that through the words of Isaiah, through the words of our God spoken to us, we're gonna enter in this kind of bubble where everything else is kept outside and where the Lord speaks to us and shows us what we really need. This morning, my prayer is that we will hear of not just our greatest need, but the most amazing joy that the Lord has to offer to us. Today's passage from God's word tells us that the thing that we need the most is the servant who is from the Lord for all nations sent to restore people to the Lord and lead them home. A little bit of context. Isaiah is writing either to people who are in exile or people who have already returned from exile. And either way, they thought they knew what they needed most. They thought they knew that what they needed most was to come back from exile and be in the land that God had promised to them. They wanted to come home. They wanted to be freed from captivity, brought out of slavery, brought back to their land. But here Isaiah has got a better promise for them. A promise of restoration with the God that they had turned away from. Restoration that was lasting and in a more complete way than they had ever experienced before. Restoration that didn't depend on their faithfulness and obedience to God, but on the faithfulness and obedience of somebody else. And that is the promise that is held out to us as well. Depending on how you look at it, I've got two points or four points. I'll let you decide which one. They're going to help us to work through this passage together, though. Um, so they should be up on the screen, Mike. The servant is from the Lord for all nations. And the servant will restore people to the Lord and lead them home. So first up, the servant is from the Lord. This is the second servant song. So throughout Isaiah, you get four songs that are written that introduce us to this character called the servant. In chapter 42, you had the kind of outline sketched of a portrait of who this servant is. And chapter 49 fills out that portrait a little bit more. We get to see more of who this servant is. And the first thing that I want us to notice together is how, as he sings, we see how interwoven the servant is with the Lord. Have a look down at the opening words of verse 1. Listen to me. Listen to me. Now, many of you know that I've got a five-year-old and a two-year-old at home, so the words, listen to me, are spoken pretty frequently in our house, okay? Now, when me or Ellie say those words, they come with an undercurrent. If you read between the lines, here's what you hear us saying. Pay attention. 
recognize the one who is speaking to you, be ready to obey the one who is speaking to you. And in a similar way, these words in Isaiah, they, they come to us for the same reasons too. Pay attention, get ready to listen, recognize the one who's speaking, get ready to obey. And throughout Isaiah, these words are only spoken by the Lord. Have a look back into chapter 48, verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, Israel, who I have called. I am he. I am the first and the last. A description that only applies to the Lord. And so the servant is singing with God's authority, speaking on behalf of God or speaking as God. It's not totally clear yet. What kind of makes it more confusing is that if you look down into the rest of verse 1, we see that the servant is a human being. Listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. The servant is a man. How can he also be the Lord? We'll come back to that in a moment. There's a bit more confusion to come across in verse 3 first. Have a look down at verse 3. The Lord said to me, the servant, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. So the servant is one man, born of a woman, but he's called Israel. Is he one man? Is he a nation? What's going on here? Have a look into verse 5. The Lord says that the servant is the one who will bring Israel back to him. So suddenly we've got Israel bringing back Israel to God. There's more in verse 2. The servant sings of how he's been prepared by the Lord, marked out for a particular task. The Lord made his mouth like a sharp sword, polished him like an arrow that will fly straight and true. What he's trying to say is those who are near and far are going to feel the effect of his powerful words. Throughout Isaiah, we see God raising up servants to do something in his name. And usually, God is going to use their political power, their physical power, to do something for him. Like, for example, King Cyrus. Cyrus is the one who releases the people of God to come back home. But here, it's not physical power, it's not political power, it's the power of his words that the servant is going to use. So what is going on here? Who is the servant? Is it the Lord? Is it a man? What's he going to do? How is he going to restore the people of God just by speaking? We're in Isaiah's time, the servant was yet to be revealed. We see that in verse 2. The mouth that's like a sharpened sword is kept in the shadow of his hand. The polished arrow is concealed in his quiver. But we look at these events from the other side. We've seen the servant revealed, and so we know who he is. We know that the servant speaks with the authority of the Lord because he is the Lord. Jesus is the Word who was with God and who was and is God, the eternal and infinite Lord, fully divine. But Jesus was and is also fully human. Born of the Virgin Mary, he is body, mind, and soul, every bit as human as you or I. Jesus, though, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be held onto. He made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness. Jesus Christ is the servant singing this song. But why is he called Israel? because he represents Israel. He is to be what Israel the nation could not be. He is to be faithful and obedient on their behalf. He is to display God's glory to the nations, something that Israel was always intended to do but couldn't do because of their sinfulness. Jesus is this servant who sings the song. And through him, 
the people of God will be restored, not just to their homeland. Something much greater than that. The servant is from the Lord, and he is for all nations. Have a look down with me at verses 5 and 6. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and God my strength, God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So the servant has been sent to Israel to gather them, but not just to bring them back to the promised land, to restore them to himself, to bring them back to him. The servant is going to go out and gather them in, like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But Israel is not enough for him. It's too small a thing for this servant to only bring those from Israel that the Lord has kept. He's been called and prepared and kept for this mission. He will be a light to the Gentiles as well. Sent to the ends of the earth to rescue God's people and bring them home. Jesus' salvation from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. From Uganda all the way to Plymouth. Everyone everywhere, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, everyone will hear of the servant. That's why he starts his song in verse 1, listen to me you islands, hear this you distant nations. He sings out to the ends of the earth to tell them your salvation is coming. So the servant is from the Lord for all nations. But what exactly is the mission of the servant? What is he going to do? The servant will restore people to the Lord and bring them home. Have a look at verses 8 and 9 over the page. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favour, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. So we've moved from the servant singing of himself to the Lord speaking about what the servant has come to do. And as you listen, I wonder if you can hear echoes from the Old Testament. This language of restoring land and reassigning inheritances, captives who are freed. It's the day of Jubilee. If you want to read more about the day of Jubilee, then look it up in Leviticus 25 when you get home. But the day of Jubilee was to be a, a year of restoration and freedom for God's people. If you had been forced to sell yourself into slavery to pay off a debt, it was the year of your freedom. If you'd been forced to sell land to pay off a debt, it was the year that the land was returned to you. Freedom and restoration flowed to the land of Israel. But here it's the Lord restoring his people to himself. Not people restoring property to each other, the Lord restoring people to himself. He's restoring so much more than their physical land. He's restoring them to himself, paying the price, not just to restore a field, but paying the price for their sins so that they can come home to him. Not just to bring someone out of physical captivity, but to bring someone out of the captivity to sin so that they can know and enjoy him forever. The one whose mouth is a sharpened sword says to his people, come out, be free. There's a hymn called In Tenderness, and there's a, a slightly modernized version, um, but the lyrics are nearly the same. But here's what they say. 
He died for me while I was sinning, needy and poor and blind. He whispered to assure me, I've found thee, thou art mine. I never heard a sweeter voice. It made my aching heart rejoice. You may be weighed down by all kinds of burdens this morning. But the thing you need more than anything else is to hear those words spoken to you. There is nothing greater, nothing more important, nothing than hearing Jesus speak those words to you. There's nothing better than knowing that the burden of sin is gone forever. There's nothing better than knowing that you have been restored to God. There is nothing better than knowing the God who has restored you and enjoying him forever. Have you ever heard Jesus speak those words to you? Have you ever felt the freedom that comes with them? He's speaking them to you now. Come out of slavery to sin. Be free. Come to me. Come away with me. Come home. The servant's mission is to restore people to the Lord and then to lead them home. If verses 8 and 9 echo the year of Jubilee, verses 9 to 11 practically shout of Psalm 23. Let's read them together. To say to the captives, come out, to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat upon them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. Psalm 23 and Isaiah 49, they, they both speak of this journey of a flock of sheep. They're being taken by their shepherds from one place to another. It speaks of the way that God guides and cares for and provides for his people. The first verse of In Tenderness goes like this. In tenderness he sought me weary and sick with sin and on his shoulders brought me back to his fold again the servant who called his people out of captivity out of darkness now calls them to follow him home to be led by him to be guided by him it's a promise that they're going to be shepherded by the lord at every turn The people of God will feed beside the roads, find pasture on barren hills. They're not going to hunger or thirst because what they need is going to be provided for them by their God. Jesus, your good shepherd, will not rescue you from sin and then leave you to go the rest of the journey on your own. He goes ahead of you goes beside you. He provides for those who are saved. He is saved. He who has compassion enough that he would die for you is not going to leave you or abandon you or forsake you. He will lead you home. Now there's no promise that the journey is going to be an easy one. The Lord talks about mountains that are ahead of his people, but he reassures us that he turns them into roads. Now, they might be, they're not going to be tarmacked or flat, okay? There's still going to be stones that you'll stumble over. You'll still slip on the scree. You're still going to struggle with the steepness. But we keep our eyes fixed on the servant who saved us, the shepherd who goes ahead of us who is leading us, trusting that he goes before us. And so we are guaranteed to make it to where he is leading us. Let's draw things to a close this morning. And as we do, let's come to verse 13. 
Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. The comfort and compassion of the Lord that we've been seeing in these verses, it wells up in us an unspeakable joy. But the joy itself is not the thing that we need the most. We might be tempted in the, in the Christian life to chase the feeling of peace or the feeling of joy. But what we need is the one who makes that joy possible in us. We need Jesus, who is the compassion and comfort of the Lord. So does the Lord fill you with joy? Are you struggling this morning to feel that joy? Can you remember the last time that it felt so powerful that you couldn't speak about it? Or maybe you just want to feel more of it. Let's have a look at some of the things we've heard this morning from Isaiah 49 that we can go away and meditate on that will help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and by God's grace feel that joy welling up in us. So first thing, the servant who came to restore us is the Lord himself. He came to gather you to himself. Have you ever thought about that? The infinite and eternal God who made everything stooped down to earth, took on human flesh to come and get you from the prison of sin that you put yourself in. He came for you personally. And he's come for all nations. That means everyone. Like, there is no one who is so hard-hearted that his sharpened mouth of a sword cannot penetrate to the heart. There's no one who is too far off for the Lord, too far gone, because he is a polished arrow, and it can be shot the distance. Whether you feel like you are too far away from the Lord to ever come close to him, know that he draws close to you. Whether you thought you were close to the Lord... But maybe you're realizing for the first time that actually you've never responded to his call to be free. He draws close to you and says, be free. Come away with me. He's the one who restores us. And that means it's not by your efforts. And that is good news. He is the one who paid the price for sin. And there is nothing left to pay. He is the one who calls us out to freedom. And finally, he is the one who leads us home. That means that even if you're feeling afflicted, he has not abandoned you. He has not forsaken you. He leads you onwards towards home, providing everything that you need to get there. Your not home yet. Don't make the mistake of thinking that this is it. There's more to come. The servant, our Lord Jesus, is for all nations, everyone. He is what we should daydream about, what we should long for. We should look forward to the day where we'll be with him home forever. But until that day, we enjoy his presence with us every step of the way by the spirit who lives in us. So let's go out from here, rejoicing in the compassion and comfort who has come to us in the person of Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord God, upon your grace, we'll daily ponder and sing anew your praise. With all adoring wonder, your blessings we'll retrace. It seems as if eternal days are far too short 
to sing your praise. Yet, Lord God, let us with our lives and our lips sing for joy of the Lord Jesus, your Son and servant, our Saviour and Shepherd. And we ask it in his name and for your glory. Amen.